you know his face and you especially know his incredible voice, it's Michael Bublé. Hello, Michael. We are headed into holiday season, and I know plenty of people will be singing along to your Christmas album. Tell us, have you gotten into the holiday spirit yet? <laughs> My Christmas tree was up so early. It was up. It was. It's been up already. For how long has it been up, Jim? Two weeks. Yeah. I feel shame for this. Oh. I do, but it's the truth. And my kids love it, and I love it, and I sing Christmas music with them, and it, I love it. I, I'm so excited. I can't. And you know what? We need it. Yeah. We need it. We need that spirit. We need the spirit of hope, and we need the spirit of of love, and we need to have that sense of empathy that people seem to have a little more of during the holiday. And I think if there ever was a time for Christmas to come along, it's it's about now. Being a famous musician in uh, 2020 has looked different than any other year. Uh, and I'd love to know what you've missed the most about your quote unquote celebrity lifestyle, or maybe you've missed nothing at all. I don't know. But what do you miss over the last few months? I, honestly, I've missed nothing. I, I mean, I listen, I wish I could be spreading joy and going out there and, you know, connecting with those beautiful audiences. But uh, the truth is, as much as I worry for people and I, I hope that uh, we get a great vaccination that works for Christmas, mm. I've had way more time to be with my kids. And, and um, it's been, you know, it's been really nice, actually, I have a you know, beautiful little daughter who's just turned two. And Aww. so it's been great to be, to be poppy. How are, how are, can I ask you something? Yeah. How are you with your kids? Like, what do you say to them through this whole thing? Uh, so my kids are 12 and 10, and the 12-year-old mm. is, like, trapped in an 85-year-old man's, like, brain. <laughs> so yeah. he has been talking me off the ledge. He's the one that has been like, Mama, it's a moment. It's a moment. We got to roll with yeah. it. It's going to be okay. And there's yeah. been a lot this year. There's been COVID. There's been racial unrest. There's been a ton. And yeah. so I find that there's been a lot of rolling conversations in our house just about how we manage and also how lucky we are. And I'm sure you have those conversations as well in your home, um, especially at this time of year, because you see people struggling, right? Yeah, of course. I had one yesterday with my, my seven-year-old. And I said to him, hey, a big part of being a good person is being grateful. And uh, you have so much, you know, we're, we're safe and we're healthy and we're warm. I'm wondering what's the most surprising thing you've learned about yourself during this pandemic? Oh, I think uh, I, I always knew that my priority was was the family. I mean, I always knew, but I don't think I I realized how how true it really was. I think it, I wondered if it was something that I would say on interviews so people might like me more or mm -hmm. or relate to me and think what a nice guy that Michael Bubbly is. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, the truth is, I realized very quickly that it was like, no, I'm this is it. It's that's all family and then everything else. Okay, so that's beautiful, but I'm going to admit something to you right now. Let's just do sure. this on national television. I yeah. don't feel like I've been the most fabulous pandemic parent, especially when the kids were learning from home <laughs> and they got to learn a lot of new words from mommy and daddy. And it was just, it was <laughs> stressful. So I wanna know from your perspective, was there anything that pushed you um, during this pandemic as a parent? Well, I mean, I think, I, listen, I think I was pretty good at homeschool teacher as far as patience goes. I just realized that my son is seven mm -hmm. and that I don't seem to have a grade one math level ability. <laughs> and uh, I'm not joking. Like, this sounds like I'm making a joke. But there was at one point where we do you know, doing on the computer and they have all these, you yeah. know, is it A, B, C or D? And there was a triangle and it and I said, "Is a triangle?" And I punched it for him because I and 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 it wasn't. It was a rhombus or something. I don't even know. <laughs> Honestly, I just realized that I looked at my wife and said, "I don't understand what they're asking. I don't understand what the computer's asking." And then I thought to myself, "He's in grade one. What happens to me when he's in grade four? Or I'm toast." 
Listen, we love being real on this show. We even have a segment that is re reoccurring called City Line Real. And one thing we talk about a lot is social media. Social media is, to me personally, a double-edged sword. It can be amazing. It can be brutal. And there's so much pressure for all of us to have an online presence so that we stay relevant or that people know what we're up to. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how you manage to reconcile what happens with social media versus using social media? Like, what kind of a relationship do you have with social media? Do you like it? Could you leave it? What do you think? I have a terrible relationship with social media. And, you know, it's, I love, I love being that connected to the people in my life and my friends and family and, and the, the, the people that listen to the music and all that. But at the same time, the very worst of us seems to come out on social media and for me it's become a a really sort of not a not the most fun place and uh the the negativity and and uh, and, and and even the danger uh is something that uh you know i i came back and i've gone back and forth and back and forth but um you know i i don't know what to say i uh I think it can be a really beautiful thing to connect us all. And I'm listen, this is so cliche. I'm just saying what all of you know. It can also be a really scary place for disinformation, for for bullying, for for yeah. really for just being able to destroy someone. And and there's such a lack of responsibility in the big corporations, uh, and even on a personal level. Yeah, I feel that. I take I take frequent breaks now because it's just something you have to keep at arm's length, right? We love that we get to claim you because, you know, in Canada, we like to, like, claim the Canadians like he's mm -hmm. one of us. So yeah. what is the most Canadian thing about you? What is, like, the defining, the definitive Canadian thing about Michael Bublé? Is it ketchup chips? Is it poutine for dinner once a week? Like, what's your thing? <laughs> I do like ketchup chips. I'll, mm. I'll just admit to that now. But uh, I honestly, this is going to sound so... Uh, and I, I don't think it's about me. I think it's about us. I think that um, self-deprecation is yeah. huge. I mean, for me, that is such a big part of, of what I do. I think as Canadians, I think that self-deprecating humor comes from us being a nation of observers. And even though sometimes we feel that we don't have a, as a distinct society as others, um, we are so distinct. We are so special. We're so interesting. Um, our history is interesting. Um, the way that we conduct ourselves. And, and um, I remember being on uh, the Colbert show years ago. And when Stephen Colbert was Stephen Colbert, he was playing the character. And he asked me why I thought that, you know, he made fun of Canadians basically and said that we, we you know, compared to Americans, we suck. And I said <laughs> to him, it's funny. I said, it's funny that you, you say that. I said, especially when I see all my American friend, friends slapping Canadian flags on their suitcases. So Mike draw. <laughs> Mic drop, Colbert. That's what you get. Now, you've been working on uh, a new fragrance by invitation. So tell us about that project, why you got into making perfumes. I bet it smells amazing. Yeah, at first I fought it. I didn't want to. I felt like it was a very cringy thing to do. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I said to my manager, listen, can I be there? Can I actually be part of it? Can I go to the to the to, to the perfumers and can i be part of creating this and i did i did everything i drove them crazy i even drove them crazy in making the packaging and and i'm really proud of it it's really a beautiful uh, product and um hard for me to sell as a hockey loving or tough muscly canadian but uh did i say muscly <laughs> uh <laughs> but um, it's really beautiful stuff i mean I like it. I look at that. I designed that package. That's very Isn't impressive. Isn't that pretty? Mike. Yeah, that's yeah. lovely. It's clean. See, I feel like the top is clean and womanly, and yeah. the middle says hockey puck. <laughs> Ooh, that beautiful, <laughs> sexy hockey puck shape. Love it. You know it. what? Though? I really love it. Is that sad to say that? I really dig it. It's really pretty. You can be a good smelling hockey guy. My husband's a good smelling hockey guy, so it's all good. Thank you so much right. for joining us, Michael. Thanks, Tracy.